the topic we have is enabling open and disaggregated transport network with modularized network gears. The gears can be hardware and can be software using open standards and common data model. My name is Yanbing Li. I'm the director of software, optical software development and product development. My colleague Calvin will be with me to do the co-presentation. He is the software architect for our embedded software. So open optical transport, we are all witnessing and living and probably making together of this transformation from vendor lock-in equipment to open disaggregated optical network. So specifically, we in Fujitsu experience very clear understanding as well as change and the transformation in these multiple areas from vendor lock-in API to open API. I will explain later our system support the open config, support open rodem, and it's very easy to extend into future open IBM, open models. Um, we move from vendor login <clears throat> boxes to disaggregated boxes. And right now we provide transponder disaggregated from rodem, and even within rodem, the amplifier can be disaggregated as well. Um, hardware control to software control, the earlier speakers talk a lot about moving all these control capabilities up to software and even conduct the optical control, optical line control feedback loop. So those are very sophisticated software control capabilities. And now SDN and disaggregation made it possible to apply cross multi vendors, not only just one vendor. Control loop, um, Closed loop network automation, analytics cloud are in the motion to getting maturity, moving from um, just the education paper to POC, and soon enough we'll see some field deployment. So the other part is Fujitsu's full stack of software and hardware. The top one is our controller, we call it Vachura. And Vachura can communicate the devices, can be across the industry, any devices. In this particular case, we put Fujitsu as the device layer. It has the rodent, it has the transponder, max bounder. The rodent and transponder, max bounder, as you can see, have very clear, it's disaggregated. And our transponder can the alien waving into a third party or a other, another open rodem box, as long as, um, yeah, as long as it's running on open API. The same thing, alien transponder from different vendors can run through Fujitsu rodem. So that's our system. Now, one of the important part which is signature of enabling Fujitsu boxes to be integrated into ONOS is this FSS2. FSS2 is Fujitsu system software generation two, we call it version two. Um, it's the next generation carry grade software package from Fujitsu, providing the latest open management interface with building extensibilities. Uh, it provides the same look and feel across the board on the open, on the rodent devices or on the transponder devices or max bounder devices or flex bounder devices across the board. Fujitsu, same look and feel. And it also can be um, used for a third party boxes, whether it's white box or gray box integrating with Fujitsu FSS2. It will show the same look and feel northbound. FSH2 is built on top of Linux and open source, and it runs on many platforms I mentioned earlier. Fujitsu organic develop platform as well as ODM. We have ODM, we, we, we actually co-develop, co-create with ODM and using FSH2 as well and white boxes. Um, it is field proven and hardened through deployment of many of the world's leading service providers in North America, in Japan, and we're expanding into India as well as Europe. 
So a bit deeper, <laughs> what is inside FSS2? So I gave some data points. Um, it's modular design. So we call it Gen 2 for a reason. Gen 1 was monolithic. So Gen 2, we move into modular with clear API definition. Northbound API going up and southbound API going down. We also have hardware to integrate. So embedded software is different from the controller up there. We have very close attachment to hardware. So how we establish a design to enable efficiency, speed, and standardization. So a device, a white box, or a gray box coming in, we could quickly and easily integrate with FSS2 and plug into the network. So nowadays, with the innovation, with the, um, the best in brief, most of them come in from smaller companies, and this is an enabler to allow that. So we have three portions, three portions of software. The base software, this is the basic backbone or infrastructure, very thin and lean. It has three functions, actually just two functions. One is the, the young, um, young based configuration management system. The other one is publisher subscriber based the, the hub as a communication center for the software. So this two running on Linux and we could support three different platforms. The, the PowerPC one and the ARM and x86 platform. On top of that, the second part is the application. Within embedded domain, we call it application, supporting layer zero WDM, layer one, layer two, layer three, and all the operations, security, uh, syslog, um, software download, firmware download, database restore, all those operation um, activities. And then we also have an aggregation capability. The aggregation capability is to enable third-party white box running in the same node uh, together with Fujitsu organically developed boxes. So this, if, if, if you can see, we could easily incorporate a third-party offered capabilities into the same look and feel and offer it into the industry. Um, we also have the white box adapter, easily adapting in, and in the future, um, wireless as well. So that's the second portion. The third portion is the hardware portion. So if you can see, this is the box. It's, um, we have a, a clean, defined um, southbound API, and we use gRPC. So all the boxes developed by Japan, uh, by, by Fujitsu, I'm sorry, by Fujitsu would align with this API. Integration will become much easier, and many automations that's done for previous version of hardware can be reused here as well. In addition, we can support the white boxes. So that's the API. And then we support multiple data models, IETF Young, this is the Fujitsu API. We do this IETF standard compliant. And we also support open road and open config. In the future, newly surfaced model, we could easily support it as well. Um, Model-driven network interfaces, NetConf, RESConf, GNMI, SNMP, WebGUI, CLI. Uh, those are all supported by FSS2. Calvin will talk a bit more later in the technical uh, details. We offer rich features. There are 60 plus OEMP features, such as zero touch provisioning, um, telemetry encryption, and recently we're adding the FIPS 142 compliance uh, capabilities too, especially for the box we are integrating with owners. Ecosystem ready, we support organic developed hardware as well as ODM and white box. So that's the um, 2000 above view of FSS2. On top of that, the, uh, the earlier speaker was talking um, automation, closed loop automation. We are in the process of enhancing our FSS2. FSS2 inside today 
already have the capability to sifting through enormous amount of logs and quickly identify the, the culprit, the root cause of the issues. So we're expanding it to provide the abnormally detection as well as um, explanation and provide by using machine learning as well as domain knowledge to provide the prediction capabilities. Then feed it up to controller. The controller will have the next network view and control the individual NEs that's running FSS2. So that's um, the brief overview of FSS2. Now coming to this reference model with ONOS, we successfully integrated T600 Fujitsu transponder that offers 600 gig. I bookended um, transponder through a uh, optical line system to Onos. So Onos, Andrea demonstrated in the booth as well. Onos will be able to discover T600 by using OpenConfig through uh, through NetConf and see the ports. Um, so that integration was actually very smooth and um, quick, fast operation. We only took two weeks. And, and the, the person who did it is relatively junior too. So um, it actually demonstrated Ono's architecture is very uh, user friendly. And we, we, we actually didn't really take a long time to learn it. And quickly we can manage to e enable this integration. So this is for phase 1.0. Um, we are planning, Andrea, we are planning to support 1.5, which is to enable the, the power and laser um, connectivities, uh, set, set up, configuration setup between the transponder and the optical line system, the third party optical line system. So definitely we, we like the model, ODT model, and we want to contribute as well. And then the same thing for future, we could potentially consider, because you, your second phase is more the ring, is a meshed uh, Rodem network, so we could consider that as well. Um, for G2 L100 and even L600 already for this too. It's just a matter of enabling the Vatura and talking with owners through Taipei. So that's pretty much the integration. We are very proud as well as uh, flattered we can have this integration opportunity with owners. Thank you very much. Um, Calvin will briefly introduce some of the technologies behind this. Uh, so this slide, uh, I'm going to talk about the challenges we face uh, when we support open model. Uh, now, uh, for transponder, you have a you can use open config, also open rodem. You have a transponder model. So it depends on what which network your operator uh, uh, need. So you may have to support either one on the network. So how how does a vendor uh, uh, to, 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 support, to support one particular open model, if you write software to, uh, to handle that model, it's very expensive uh, if you have multiple open models. And, and then your code will be pretty messy because you have so many different models you need to support. So uh, our solution is to do model transform, transformation. Uh, model transformation means uh, under, underneath, we have this vendor model, and then on the top, when you should, if you want to add an open model, we're going to transform uh, the, mod, for the open model into a vendor model, attribute by attribute. And the way we do that is uh, we basically we look at the, the two models, look at all the attributes, and figure out what are the common rules to transform the attributes. Uh, the rule, for example, in one model, uh, you have an attribute. Uh, it's a 32-bit integer. The other one is 64-bit uh, integer. Or once one one model the attribute is a, a list a enumerated a enumerated type of, of uh, 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 element and the other side have another enumerated type but they don't match they are not they they are different and so how do we map 
transform from one numerator type to another numerator type. So that's part of the transformation rule. Uh, another, another common rule is we see one attribute can map into multiple attributes in data model. And sometimes it even uh, map to multiple models. And so we so we come up with all this, look at all the model, all the, all the attributes, and then we figure out some of the common rule to transform them. If the rule is the same for different attributes, then we can use the same software to do that. Uh, uh, so, the, so once you identify all the attributes, how you map one model to another model, we write a, a, a generic engine, which is your green uh, box at the bottom there. Uh, so that, that engine just, Looking at the rule, looking at your your uh, uh, transform map, how you map the transform, and, and it just runs generically. So with that uh, uh, technology, we can uh, we don't have to write software when you when you want to need, need to support a, a new model. We just need to figure out all the rules, all the attributes, all the rules, and then create create a mapping between the two models and your engine, your common engine, you just run through the engine, look at the rule, uh, and you can handle any command from the top, from the open model to your, your device model. And so that's the transformation technique. And we, for open config, we, we for the uh, platform model, where, where all the component, where all the equipment, uh, a lot of the attribute can be transformed by generically, by rules. Like more than 80% of the attribute uh, in, the, in that open config platform model, you can transform to the vendor model. And same, same thing with the terminal device, and more than 70% of the attribute can be transformed. Now your software will be a lot smaller because you don't have the right code for all, handle all the attribute now. You have a common engine, and then all the common stuff, you can just use the engine. No new code need to be written. Only the stuff, that are some of the attribute is specific, you need the right code for that. So you can go from a thousand lines of code to 200 lines of code. Uh, this one talk about our uh, experience with uh, supporting GNMI in, on FSS2. Uh, GNMI is a, a, a device, support device configuration, and another thing is support telemetry using the same interface. Uh, so, but uh, GNMI has use, has four services. Uh, capability, get, set, and subscribe. Capability is your, for your uh, controller to discover the, uh, the capability of the device. Uh, capability can be uh, the model you support, uh, the encoding you support. Get and set is just setting and getting attributes from a device. Subscribe is you can request data from a device. And this is how telemetry is supported by the sub subscribe service. Uh, you have different way of sending data. It's stream, once, and poll. Stream is you ask the device to constantly send you data. And once is uh, the, 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 the device will send you send the data once, and then you, it, it will stop. And poll is whenever you ask the device, the device will send you a snapshot of that data. Subscription mode, you have on-chain sample and target defined. On-chain is uh, when there's, when there's a change in the data, the device will, will send you, like alarm. If there's an alarm raised or clear, then you will get the unchanged. Sample is more for the PM. You want periodic reading of the data, and that's a sam sample. Target define is let your, the device de uh, decide uh, the data type. For example, uh, alarm, he will decide, I will use, I want to use unchanged, and, and PM, I want to use sample. So the device will design that. Now, to, to, enable, to support GNMI, there are several technologies around it we need to uh, use also. GRPC is the remote procedure call. You can call a, a procedure in the remote, uh, on the device, and the device will return you back data. Uh, and, and GRPC also uses protocol buffer. Uh, protocol buffer is a mechanism, is a technology to ser uh, efficiently serialize your message on, on, on the wire. And I will have some uh, detailed slides later on each of these technology. And GMI require uh, mutual uh, authentication, meaning the device has to authenticate uh, the, the controller. The controller has to authenticate uh, 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 the, the, con uh, the, de the, uh, the device. And they use TLS. And now I have a slide on the TLS. And the GMI support uh, uh, any tree structure data, Yang is one of them, and there's other tree structure data GNMI can support. And like it's, the telemetry is, is, is in the same in the interface. And 
And this one talk about, uh, I'll just give an introduction of the TLS uh, uh, needed. Uh, for the uh, encryption part, we use a symmetric key, uh, a public key and private key. So uh, the, on both sides, the client and server, when they talk each, each side, we have a pair of public key and private key. They exchange public key. And the other side receives the public key. When he wants to encrypt the data, he will use the public key to encrypt the data we send to the other side. The other side will use uh, the private key to uh, uh, decrypt the data. Uh, so that's asymmetric key. There's other uh, mechanism in TLS, like asymmetric key. I'm, I'm not going to talk about that, the detail on the TLS. Uh, the other, for authentication, uh, we use a certificate, uh, TLS certificate. Uh, there's two types of certificate. Uh, the first type is a CA, a CA certificate. There's some uh, uh, entity called a certificate uh, authority. Uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the controller or the device will create a, server, uh, uh, a certificate uh, signature request. In, in, the, in the CSR, uh, the, the device will put his information, like how uh, the IP address, how, how you access my box, and what's my public key, and I put it in the CSR, and then send it to the CA. The CA will do some checking, verify you are the, the guy who owns the certificate, and he will sign the, sign the certificate. And so now the certificate is signed. He sent the certificate back to you. So both sides, the client side and the server side, will get a certificate and has your public key in there. And uh, now the CA will also uh, issue his own certificate because when you receive a certificate from the other side, you need to verify the signature. The CA signature. So it was using that CA certificate. So the CA certificate will be installed on both the client and the server side. Uh, during the connection setup, both sides will exchange certificate, and then you will, and both sides will use the CA certificate to look at the to look at the signature, make sure it's valid, and then no, nobody changed the, the certificate, and and then he will use the public key to do the encryption sent to the other side. So that's the summary of, of TRS, uh, how TRS work. Uh, protocol buffer is an uh, efficient way to serialize data uh, on the wire. Uh, at, the, at the bottom is one example uh, of, of a, a protocol buffer message. Uh, so in the message, next to the, next to the, the field, you have a, a number in there. So that number will be uh, will be put on the wire instead, instead of the variable. So it's an it's a integer, uh, which is a lot smaller than, you, than, than your actual variable. That's why, that's why it's compact, the, the, the uh, protocol buffer, when it's, when it's on the wire. Uh, but you need, you need a protocol buffer on, on, on the other side in order to decode the message, because it's a binary message. You need to know the format of the protocol buffer. It's backward compatible, meaning you can update your protocol buffer message. But your, your code that is built on the old protocol buffer message version, you will still run with new field added. Because uh, you can just ignore, ignore those fields. You can still decode that, that, that new message with your old code with, without, any pro in it, without any issues. So it's backward compatible. And you can write uh, client and server program in, in, in different, different languages. And you still can talk to each other. And that's what I have on a protocol buffer. Uh, remote procedure call is the way you can, for a, a client to invoke uh, a service on the other side, on, on the, on the uh, device, and the device will respond back with some information. That's a remote procedure call. Uh, uh, GRPC has some tool sets. Uh, you can build client, you can build, build uh, stops on, on to help you to read and write messages, very, very simple, very simple. Uh, and your, again, your client server can write in different programming language, it use protocol buffer to, to send data, and it sub, uh, support authentication and encryption using TLS. And uh, on that side, it's a GNMI, one of the G, part of the GNMI protocol, uh, protocol definition is that's the service part we talked about earlier. It defines the capability, get, set, and subscribe service. Uh, telemetry is getting is very important for uh, uh, machine learning.
because you need uh, a lot more frequent reading of your of your of your data, uh, and also for monitoring uh, your equipment and. Uh, so the data can be uh, your PM data, your alarm data, CPU usage, memory usage, et cetera. And there's two types of telemetry. One is called dial-in and dial-out. In dial-in telemetry, is the collector will connect, initiate a connection to the device and subscribe data, issue a, a, a subscription to the data and telling it what data you need and how often do you want the, the device to send you data. And after that subscription, the device will keep sending data back to you. Uh, so that's dial-in telemetry. Dial telemetry is a little bit different. It's a controller will go, you uh, connect to the device, do some configuration change on your device, and, and, figure, and indicate what, what uh, data you want to uh, stream out and how often you want to stream that. After the configuration is done, the device will look at uh, the destination you want, to, you want to send and then initiate a connection to, to uh, the collector and then start streaming the data. So in GNMI, it is a, currently it's it support dial-in telemetry using the subscribe service. Uh, there's a lot of use cases you can enable once, once we have telemetry. Uh, you can monitor the system, do some machine learning, anonymous detection, uh, hardware of, of prediction, software prediction, uh, capacity planning. At the bottom of the diagram, we have one use case uh, that is trying to do some Using telemetry data, we are pulling optical power from multiple nodes in the rodum uh, and a bit array from a transponder, a bit of VR transpo transponder. And that one is just showing uh, the top of the graph is the bit array. And at the bottom of the two graph is the optical power transmit and the optical power received on the, on the other side. And, and it shows if I decrease my optical power transmit and on my path, my bit error rate is going to go in, increase. And that'd be more, this is just monitoring, but there'd be more you can build on top of that once telemetry is, 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 will be, is used. And I'm going to let Yan Bing to. Uh, Very quickly, to take away. So we support continuously the ODTN and uh, ONOS, and we will continue to um, establish closer relationships with the ecosystem through our product lines. Um, that's pretty much our presentation. Thank you very much for your time and your attention. So any questions to Calvin and myself? Can pass around the mic if there are any. Anybody has any questions? I have one. Um, so you decided to go for GNMI. You also have the Netcom support, but you decided to embrace GNMI as uh, apparently a very native technology. Uh, why was that decision? Um, why, why benef what's the benefit that you see from GNMI over Netconf? Yeah, because GNMI, uh, it, it comes with a lot, a lot of other technology, like GLPC, protocol buffer, and the efficiency. Now, Netcom, you're, you're sending XML. You're sending XML out. And, and GRPC, I think, is proven to, to be a, a, a very efficient way of, of uh, requesting a service and getting something back. Uh, I think that's the main reason for efficiency. And you also come with a lot of tool sets. Writing software uh, using GRPC, I think, uh, is very easy. Because you can uh, write the tool set, we're going to generate stops, and, and you just use a stop to, to do a remote procedure call, reading, writing your data with very little software development. The speed of development, software development. In addition, this is majority of the DCI market customer asking. So we'll provide what customer asks. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, any other questions? Hi. I was just wondering, thanks a lot for the slide about telemetry and the importance of uh, gathering uh, performance data very often in a continuous manner. Um, I was wondering, are you aware of any any uh, standardization effort in this area? Because there is NetConf, of course, and there is the NMDA effort to split the data stores into, well, it's complicated, right? Mm -hmm. 
And uh, there are also NetConf notifications, but as far as I know, there is uh, nothing like a generic framework for uh, subscribing to updates within an operational data store, for example. So I, I see that you have effectively solved this via, via GNMI. Mm -hmm. Just wondering if you know about any effort within NetConf which standardized this. Uh, NetConf, you can do subscriptions, it's mainly for alarm getting alarm, alarm streaming back to you. But uh, there's no periodic sending of data other than you have to poll, you have to poll. Uh, you've used NetConf. Yeah. And I'm not aware of any. any. No, not, even as far as I know, there is really not. NetConf is just used for alarms, and we do that. Uh, and as, as Calvin was saying, in Onos, we can read the current input and output power, but that's a polling every, <laughs> very often in, uh, against NetConf. With, uh, with GNMI, uh, you could get that uh, for free because of the gRPC, you get automatic notifications. And uh, if you guys go take a look at the MicroOnos demo, there we have a native GNMI southbound. So I might look forward to using your device on that side too.